Today's episode is in part brought to you by Fabulous. So, you want to study English literature. Is it a bad choice or a good choice? Is it a waste of your time or is it not? So that's what we're going to cover in today's video. Here are three things that I wish I knew when I started my English degree. So personally, I am actually finishing off my degree. I have one more week of this degree to go. So I'm at the very tail end of my journey here, speaking as a bit of a senior citizen of undergrad studies. During this time, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made a lot of friends, made a lot of enemies with writers, with, well, writers who are dead. And here are some of the things that I can point out to you so you don't have to fall into the same traps. Let us start off with the preamble. Now, the fact of the matter here is that an English degree is actually not a very easy degree to do. Of course, you can compare this degree to engineering degrees, to computer science degrees, to many other great degrees in a STEM subject area. There will come a time for every English literature student out there, freshmen, greenhorn freshmen, when they head into an English lit class, that they flick open that first novel that they're supposed to read for their class, and they're gonna scratch their hands and gonna wonder, hey, this is written in English, right? And I speak English, but why is it the case that this piece of writing just simply doesn't make any sense to me. That, my friends, is why we have English degrees in the first place, is to really facilitate this area in our brains called literacy. So really, before you're heading to an English degree, view this entire process as a process of training. You're training your brain to read stuff. You're training your brain to comprehend stuff that you couldn't comprehend, really, before. And the skills that you're going to acquire from this degree, the skill of close reading, the skill of uh, interpreting theory and the skill of applying theory to your primary texts. Well, these are skills that are basically going to stay with you forever. A really good image is this. You're heading into this degree to surgically rewire your brain to think in a different way. Because right now, um, well, when you're just starting out fresh, it's, well, it's not that intuitive. It's not exactly clear what this degree will do for you three years down the road. And hopefully after listening to today's tips, you will walk away with a clear understanding of what an English lit degree is all about, or how do you exactly tackle it? How do you exactly tackle it to the ground? How do you exactly graduate on time? So buckle up, and here's tip number one. One of the most shocking things that I had to learn was the fact that you actually don't have to do all of your readings when you're part of an English degree. You're walking around campus, you're looking at all of these people stressing out about lectures about biochemistry, uh, stressing out about lectures on some principles of engineering. And when you hop on your own module on your computer, you realize that, wow, there's a lot of reading material in there. Probably a few novels on your reading list. And of course, there's going to be a dozen, you know, secondary readings, academic papers that you have to dig through. The immediate impulse here is to jump on a wagon, chain yourself to a chair, drink four coffees a day just to get them all done. But what if I told you that you actually don't have to read all the required readings for your classes, especially for English Lit? To understand this tip, we really do have to understand the purpose of reading material for a Lit class because it's quite different from all, all the STEM courses out there. Primary reading materials are your novels, your poems, your plays, you know, these great pieces of literature you're written by people in the past. These are subjects of your studies that you're going to potentially write an essay on, that you're potentially going to do a presentation on, that you're potentially going to do um, an entire reinterpretation on in the case of theater. And secondary readings are really tools or commentaries by critics, by academics, by other smart people to help you understand your primary text a little deeper, to facilitate your understanding using academic critical thinking. Put them together, you're going to end up with a pretty substantial reading list. And now here's the problem. To expect yourself to read all of it, to read every single little piece of this thing on this, well, subject reading list, is kind of like you turning yourself into an information machine. You're just ingesting information like a sponge. In the opening scene of one of my favorite Netflix series, The Chair, well, Harold Bloom, there's a Harold Bloom quoting there somewhere, where he basically wrote that, in an age where information is endlessly available to us, where shall wisdom be found? So if we're just treating these reading materials as information, if we're just adopting that mindset of like, I need to get through all of these on time, well, we're simply just ingesting information without really understanding anything. Given that the main goal of these readings is to foster your understanding, sometimes it's actually better to be selective with your reading, to read not five academic papers, but two, but read them really, really, really well. Sometimes instead of reading all the 10 novels sign in a course. Maybe it's better to read two of them, but to read them really, really well, to pick through every line and to reinterpret these pieces of primary text through the theories that you've read. So be very selective with your reading. And in most cases, you will be assessed based on a form of an essay. So my recommendation is you can just look through these essay assignments first. You can look, look at some of these questions of these essays and decide, hey, 
uh, which two novels are the most interesting to me? Which two academic journals are the most appealing to me? How do I read these few texts really well and read these few papers really well? as to construct a really well-written well paper on a very specific subject. And plan your studies around those few very interesting and very crucial pieces of information and pieces of novels instead of just reading everything all at once. And over time, as you continue with your degree, you're gonna get this sort of like a spider sense of like, hey, I think this is important and this is not important. I think this is interesting and this is not interesting. And that basically leads to this idea of specialization in academia, which is probably not the best thing to do, but for the purpose of uh, getting a really good result for your degree, this is one of the things that you have to do. Be selective. And tip number two is something that's very important for me personally. That's um, crucially important, in fact. I've addressed this point before in other videos, but I think it's worth mentioning again. You, if you want to survive this degree, just like many other degrees out there, as younger people, we have to focus on building better personal habits. Whatever happened to this idea of the neurotic intellectual or the tortured genius of an intellectual, always in the library, always reading 20,000 books, that's simply a very erroneous image when you are looking at academia. Of course, it's a very intellectually strenuous endeavor. And of course, there will be nights where you have to pull an all-nighter just to get an assignment done. But to use that as an excuse not to take care of yourself, well, it's not a very fair trade. Humankind, for the past few hundred years at least, um, I mean, even now, uh, we've been plagued by this idea of the mind and substance duality. Somehow we're all committing this Cartesian error of separating the brain from the body. So you think your brain's gonna work well without a, without a functioning body? But here's the truth, not just for English majors out there, um, but but for any other university majors out there. Your body is not separate from your mind, and if you don't take care of your health, if you don't take care of uh, the basic faculties like nutrition and exercise and many of those really basic things that somehow brainy people think that they're above, your brain will simply turn into a mush. Sometimes you could uh, get into a state of a brain fog where you can't even interpret a text that you wish to interpret, where you can't even turn out an essay on time. So here's really something that I've been working on recently, personally. And here's where I have to tell you a little bit about today's video sponsor, Fabulous. As someone who really struggles to come down to planet Earth from the clouds, because I'm always living up here. At times, it is a struggle to take care of things like nutrition, like exercise, like planning out my personal habits, like adopting healthier uh, habits like meditation or morning jogging or cooking on time. And sometimes stuff like this really demands an extra tool for us to do the job a little better. So here's where Fabulous comes in. It is an app that serves as a habit tracker that tracks many of the things in my personal life. For downloading Fabulous, I've adopted a daily meditation routine. I started cooking better. I started running running every morning. And then after a few months, I, I basically contacted the founders and I was like, what is going on with this app? It's simply amazing. More people should know about this. The most crucial piece of my day is my morning. And I've committed myself to a pretty elaborate morning routine, which you could check out in my video on morning routines. But this app simply served as a reminder for me to remain consistent for me to stay on course, and also just to free up more energy for me to feel better so I can return to whatever work I'm doing, to whatever situation I'm in with a more stable mind. Because let's face it, sometimes um, uni work could drive you insane. And for those of you who wanna take an extra step to personalizing your life or improving your life, Fabulous also offers these amazing behavior change programs based on cognitive science. These are programs custom tailored to specific themes, specific goals that you can follow to foster your personal development. Nevertheless, Fabulous is offering the first 100 people who click on the link in the description down below a 25% discount on your subscription. And if you wanna free up the energy, if you wanna be less neurotic, if you wanna basically have your life together alongside your academic pursuits, give Fabulous a try. It's an amazing app. Thank you, Fabulous, for supporting this channel. And now, back to the last tip. So tip number three is gonna be a little bit technical. It's gonna be a little bit kind of like, whoa, why haven't I heard about this before? So in my episode on close reading, I explained that there are mainly two ways of interpreting literature. One is interpretation through close reading, and another one is interpretation via theory. Now, literary theory is like kind of like this boogeyman that first year lit students always find an excuse not to engage with because it's difficult, because it's quite complicated, because most literary critics are actually philosophers, and we all know how difficult philosophers are to 
read. So there's definitely that impulse to stay away from lit theory for, for as long as possible, you know, to sort of like push the shit under the rug for as long as possible. But just from personal experience, uh, a lot of the students who did not engage with critical theory from the very start of their degrees, they've struggled significantly when they're doing, when they're tackling third year lit subjects. Close reading, even though it's a very good skill to have, even though you're gonna be practicing a ton of it during your degree, um, it's simply sometimes not enough. Your own conclusions about literature, they've probably, someone else had probably thought about them before you. People who are smarter than you in the past, people who are literally professional literary critics, and people who have been doing this for, you know, many centuries. So the job of reading literary theory is to really give you a quicker access or kind of like a cheat code for you to be kind of like, oh wow, this is how Walter Benjamin interpreted this poem, or this is how this specific theorist performed his close reading on this text. And the right critical theory in conjunction with the right set text or primary text could land you some really, really good talking points in your essay. However tough it is, if you tackle critical theory head on during your first year studies, it's gonna be really difficult. It's gonna drive you insane sometimes. It's gonna require extra work, but over the course of your degree, you're just kind of watch yourself accumulating these different perspectives from different uh, theorists of the past. You're gonna find yourself interpreting a piece of text uh, with greater depth to the point where you're just kind of like, I've charted the entire field. I've understood what other critics have said, and now here's my turn to prove that I can do this as well. So alongside your course readings, invest a bit of time per week into reading literary theory of your favorite theorists. And of course, I'll make more videos about my favorite theorists in the future and to give you guys some pointers and tips and recommendations. Nevertheless, that's all I have for today's video. Three things that I wish I knew when I started my lit degree. And I hope that you've enjoyed this video thoroughly and I will see you in the next one. Take care and goodbye.